The man to whom the country is most indebted for the great measure of independency is Mr. John Adams of Boston. I call him the Atlas of American Independence. Richard Stockton, New Jersey, signer of the Declaration of Independence. He means well for his country. He's always an honest man, often a wise one, but sometimes, and in some things, absolutely out of his senses. Benjamin Franklin. He stands nearly alone in the history of our public men in never having had his integrity called in question or even suspected. Benjamin Rush, Pennsylvania, signer of the Declaration of Independence. Whether he is spiteful, playful, witty, kind, cold, drunk, sober, angry, easy, stiff, jealous, cautious, confident, closed, open, it is always in the wrong place or to the wrong person. James McHenry, War Secretary, Adams Administration. John Adams could be loud, overbearing, and conceited, but he was also a brilliant statesman whose iron will kept the sometimes fickle and timid Continental Congress steadily on the path to independence. He was the nation's second president, serving one term from 1797 to 1801. He was the first chief executive to live in the White House, or President's House, as it was then called. But the residence, as Adams knew it, was unfurnished, bare-walled, and chilly in the winter months. He was a Unitarian who walked daily for exercise, used tobacco, and liked to fish. He was also an avid reader, often marking up the margins of his books with choice critical comments. He grew up the eldest of three boys in the countryside of eastern Massachusetts. He was a Harvard-educated lawyer by the time he began courting his third cousin, Abigail Smith. Nine years his junior, Abigail was a shy young woman of 17, in frail health, and like her new suitor, fascinated with the world of books. At this time, he was a stocky young man approaching 30, about five foot six, with blue eyes and brown hair that he covered with a powdered wig. Though his humble country origins rankled the sensibilities of his future mother-in-law, John Adams wed Abigail Smith in October of 1764. They had five children and were married 54 years. In letters, they called each other dearest friend. He was a discontented vice president under George Washington, calling the post, quote, the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived. Though in fits of pique, he sometimes referred to the deeply revered Washington as old muttonhead, Adams thought the president should officially be addressed as his highness, an idea that provoked much ridicule. Critics soon started calling the slightly overweight Adams his rotundity. He was 61 when he became president. His proudest achievement was keeping the nation out of war with France, but in part because most people supported such a conflict, his unpopularity persisted, and Thomas Jefferson, his vice president, soundly defeated him in the election of 1800. Adams left town at dawn on March 4, 1801, skipping his successor's inaugural, and returned to Massachusetts. He stayed active in retirement, working on an autobiography and corresponding with old friends from the Revolution, including Jefferson. When he was 89, he received news that his son, John Quincy, had been elected president. The next year, on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, he fell into a coma, emerging briefly to utter his final words, Thomas Jefferson still survives. In fact, however, Jefferson had died earlier that same day. Adams died shortly thereafter from heart failure and pneumonia. He was 90. <laughs>